Hello, everyone, and we are in the third day of ASL Season 17. And again, joining me today, it is Mihai, the Terran guy, Gypsy93. What's up? <laughs> How long did it take you to come up with that one, Dan? <laughs> Actually, I thought about that one yesterday. Yeah, and when I you was... went to sleep, you're in bed just thinking, <laughs> yeah. what am I going to say? Yeah, yeah, we got the Bill Nye, the science guy reference, but also the Terran guy, GY reference on your Ab name. Absolutely, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am a guy. I'm Guy, you're Nye. Yeah. That rhymes. We're here. 5 a.m. once again. Yep. Did you get your sleep in? Actually, I was about to mention that yesterday I was up maybe like not necessarily 40 hours straight, but pretty close because huh? I didn't sleep very well yesterday. But today I slept almost completely through straight to uh, from like eight to four. So I'm feeling yeah. pretty good, which is why I'm able to troll so early in the morning. Well, eight, eight, well, yeah, eight, as, as you do, you know, go to sleep at 8 p.m. Um, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that your circadian rhythm now revolves around the ASL, as it should. Yeah. Uh, today's group is uh, crazy. It is crazy. You know, also something that I was thinking about was... I was like, who the heck is Tangu? And then I thought, you remember Flash had a student like three or four years ago? Where when he was him? doing part of the university thing? Yeah, I was wondering, is Tangu the student that Flash coached? I can't I remember. Don't think so. no, you don't, I think, don't so? think so? No. No. Okay. Yeah, I went and looked him up on Liquipedia and there was no mention of it. And I thought, well, maybe it actually is him because I feel like the name, like the ID, oh, also started yeah. with a T. Um, but the thing is, he's actually um, quite old. Well, <laughs> not old. I mean, he's, uh, he's my age. Uh, but. Oh. Uh, He's I, I if I recall correctly, Flash was coaching uh like a uh, a high schooler or something. Okay, yeah, I mean that sounds correct. I didn't actually check his age, but uh, I I was just wondering about that. Like, is this actually the guy that Flash coached? Like, you know, we coached him three years ago, and here he is. Yeah, I remember. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, there was hype surrounding a Terran player, and. He, I don't think that they played in in the ASL though, did they? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe ACS. But either way, we've got our resident expert Brian Jinjin in the chat. He says he's just an amateur. Oh well, there you go. Um, Tengu, honestly, I'm very excited about this guy. Is uh, he's really good? He's awesome. Um, I played him. I know you've probably played him i've played him a bunch of times on ladder he's really strong and uh this guy basically has had probably the hardest road to the asl out of any player because he ha he's had to play in the acs which is the africa challenger series and that's kind of like their way of trying to promote some new talent where it's open only to players who have not qualified for asl before i believe and so it's a bunch of amateurs who are insanely high skilled and and not just that but they're very driven they're all like insane grinders but so there's this tournament and then when you win the tournament right which is an insanely difficult tournament to win <laughs> you don't even get placed into asl you get placed into the final round of one of the asl qualifiers so Tengu had to win the qualify the the tournament, and then he had to win the finals finals in a in a qualifier, which means he could have been playing anyone, like even a pro. Yeah, so it's quite impressive, <laughs> really. And yeah. To give you perspective, the Walt played in a couple of these this time around. Like it wasn't really his season. Uh, he kind of, I think he lost in the first round of the ACS, but in previous seasons he's done very well. But that like gives you an idea. Of the level of play the wall who's someone in you know the foreigner region he signs up for a tournament he's winning right and it's not close <laughs> yeah absolutely and uh well tengu i think uh is going to be very difficult for him because this is probably his first uh, you know he is an amateur and this is probably his first offline event pretty much uh especially in front of a crowd 
And especially, honestly, no meme, but playing Terran is incredibly difficult in these kinds of circumstances. Um, because, it, you know, you just have, like, there's just no, you know, there's no gimmick. And this guy plays a super honest, like, standard game. So he's going to have his work cut out for him. And this group is full of absolute killers, man. Yeah, but he's not afraid to play his style because actually there's a video on Light's uh, YouTube channel uh, if you are a member of his channel. And actually, it's him playing versus Tengu, and he's doing like a guide on how to play versus Gasless. So if you're playing Gasless versus a pro, I mean, you're, you're willing to play macro games, right? You're willing yeah. to not just try and bbs your way to a, a free win and get lucky so i'm really excited to see him try and pull out the stops all the stops here versus all these players i guess the real question is you know there are players that can get nervous offline there are players that are just stone cold killers they don't get affected at all that's really what i want to see whether he'll be nervous or whether he'll actually be able to bring his a game because everybody here best he's been like in pro league and stuff for 20 years same thing with action Sock too. Like everybody here has had a ton of experience. Yeah, these guys are about as <laughs> as experienced as you can get, honestly, and and top tier as you can get, really. You know, best obviously. He was <laughs> he was short of winning that OSL against the uh, July that many years ago. He's always been super super high skill. I mean, action as well. Sock. We all know Sock. Sock's history as basically an SKT Terran. Um, so this group is going to be insane, really. And honestly, anyone can make it out of here. Yeah, well, by, by the way, that's yeah. that at the bottom. It says that Action has a 60% win rate versus Terran, only 40% yeah. win rate versus Protoss. I mean, still 40% is really good. But like I was mentioning yesterday, the past two or three seasons, Action has faced off versus Best every single time. And they yeah. always had epic games. I think best one overall, like three or three oh or four oh, but action had chances to win there. Like I think you take the forty percent win rate with a grain of salt because he definitely could have put a couple more victories on the board. Well, we were also talking about how best in action and sock uh, all of these guys have incredible versus Terran matchups. Yeah. Uh and uh I think that's <laughs> gonna kind of skew the results in the in that favor for this group like i'm expecting most likely best in action to make it through um since ultimately they only have to win versus Terran, uh, and if they don't drop their games versus Terran, given the fact that there's two Terrans in this group and they're not facing each other in the first uh in the first series i i think it's very likely that they probably make it through sock is uh, a tvt god uh but he has had missteps in in versus zerg and versus protoss yeah and another update on what that graphic said at the bottom when they were talking to sock it said that he has not had a single win versus zerg since season three yeah that is that is a long time but to be fair to sock just because you don't have a win since that long ago you got to consider how many times he's played in ASL and how many times his opponent has actually been a Zerg player, which I am not, you know, completely aware of. But um, yeah, this is this is going to be a, a tough group. And yeah, I absolutely. About if you can just get win versus Terran, you're going to make it out. Uh, well, Tengu seems to be uh, holding him his own on stage. Yeah. Um, it's it's crazy, honestly. Uh, when when you're uh, basically a pro in in Korea, when you're trying to play StarCraft uh, competitively in Korea, not only do you have to be a god at the game, but uh, honestly, these days this landscape, you kind of have to be a pretty you know pretty comfortable as a personality, as a public personality, because you're either streaming, you're here on stage trying to build the narrative for everyone. So. I can only imagine what he's going through as uh, as an amateur, but uh, it's honestly to me that's the most exciting part of this group. This guy is awesome. Uh, there's always been some really sick amateurs that make it to the round of 24. Uh, we've had Sins in previous season, uh, Yoon as well, uh, who who these. 
players, maybe some of the viewers don't know, but they're absolute insanely skilled top amateurs who obviously are going to have a hard time in, in this ASL, especially given the fact that they're playing versus players who basically have lifetime, like a lifetime of experience of playing on stage. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be nervous at all. They're going to be able to play at their top form like you see online. And it's funny that you mentioned all the amateur players that are just surprisingly good. I mean, I had the same experience. I mean, I've told you this story before when I was playing in Bi Clan. I would get set up matches from by the clan leader about uh, playing with people from White Clan or FOU Clan or Name Clan, etc. And you're just like, who's this guy? And you play him and he's the best player you've ever played. And then you play another player from the same team and it's the best player you've ever played. And you're like, wait a minute, if these people aren't even pro and I'm just getting bashed on. Like, oh yeah, he's he's so-and-so, but he's only a practice partner for this team. It's like, oh my God, dude, like how deep is yeah. the Korean talent pool? Absolutely. I mean, how deep is the talent pool in the world? You know, I think there's a lot of really talented people out there just waiting to be discovered in so many fields, but often, um, you know, the there's there's not that many people looking for them. Obviously, in, in Korean StarCraft right now, I think uh, uh, it is very focused on these big personalities, these established pros who, in, in their own right, are for sure the best uh, in the game currently. But I think there's a lot of talent to be explored. Unfortunately, it's just not really an environment in which, you know, you can kind of go and look for them, uh, at least uh, visibly, unless you're, you know, in the scene playing, you kind of know them. But today, Group C, again, best Tengu action sock. We had some nice games, honestly, in Groups A and B uh, yesterday, especially Mind. He played, Mind and Bisu, honestly, have been the highlights for me in this tournament. They've just played like killers so far. Yeah, as a turn player, I, I'm a little more biased towards Mind. It's just always so surprising. He just shows up and he's like, uh, yeah, I'm I'm still the man. Like, I, I still just kill everybody. I yeah. still can't get over that engagement that he had on Radeon where, like, it's he's down 30 supply, the fight ends, and he's up 10. It's like, uh, why don't my fights go like that? We're getting a look at the players from today. I can see that match history, it says action 1-0 over Sock in the round of 24 in Season 15, so recent history there. I was talking about best versus actions recent history yeah. in the past three or four games it seemed like best has gotten the best of him and it says that overall best is seven and three versus action and the last time they played was in the round of 16 if i read that correctly of season 16 yeah uh well they they've played a, <laughs> they played a lot of times honestly in my mind being a taren player you know being that biased tesagi gamer mm. I uh, only recall mostly series involving Terrence or uh, minis PVZs. Those are always legendaries, but I actually don't remember watching best. I, I don't remember watching best play PVZ in general, but it is his highest win rate matchup in ASL. Yeah, even though <clears throat> even though best is known for his PVT, his actual best matchup is PVZ. And there's a reason for that. It's because best of course has insane macro but he's also willing to play different builds like he'll play maelstrom builds actually i feel like he was one of the innovators of maelstrom uh he'll play a bunch of different styles we're getting a look at tengu stats you can see uh it's just displaying his acs run I, I don't know exactly who these players are like what their actual korean name to id is but in the final uh qualifier day two that you see actually the person that he beat to make it was Toolbo, aka YSC. Yeah, YSC, uh, obviously kind of a mainstay at this point of the uh, scene. And uh, well, in the ACS, actually, Tengu beat Rich in the final, who's uh, also kind of a godly top uh, Protoss player, actually, amateur player who will maybe at some point also make it into ASL, hopefully. I think the one uh, thing with Korean StarCraft right now is that they're really struggling with uh, how, like the Protoss talent. 
and especially the up and coming ones. You know, it's very hard to like they. You know, we're kind of waiting for some more Protoss players here. Um, but uh, for now, Tengu versus Best. Tengu definitely has his work cut out for him. Well, I mean, it's tough, right? Just in general for Protoss players. Yes, Protoss players in the foreign scene, they're amazing. But once you reach a certain level, there's there's the gatekeepers of the other races. You know, get gatekept by Terran players in TVZ. Get gatekept by Zerg players uh, in PVZ. So it's not not really a surprise to me to not see that many up-and-coming Protoss players. Or not necessarily up-and-coming, but uh, new Protoss players making it in. Because it's just so difficult. Looks like our players are ready so we're about to get into game one by the way guys i was reviewing the vod from yesterday and my audio levels was a little bit off so if you have input on what needs to be balanced here you can put it in the chat and i can try and fix it yeah and uh well i'm kind of uh waiting in anticipation here i'm really excited to watch this game <laughs> I don't know if it sounds convincing from how I'm saying it, but I'm actually feeling it. Like I'm really interested to see how Tengu does here, and I really hope he can he can give us a good game uh, because that's how you build your confidence, you know. And uh, especially against someone like Best, I mean, this is probably one of the worst matchups you could ask for uh, for your first game in the ASL, but he can do it. Um, best obviously he's here uh it, you know it's like another day at the office for him yeah well i mean as a player like it, it gives you hope right like you've got you've got quite a bit of skill you know i'm a little bit lower than you but when you play somebody on the ladder uh somebody like tangu like for example if i was to play hmm, if the hm guy the Zerg yeah player, or saber right I, I play those people more often than i play tangu right but if i was to see those two make it into asl it would give me hope right like maybe one day it, that could be me right so i can relate to that but we are ready for game one it is going to be best facing off versus tengu his first appearance in the asl okay in the bottom left we have best and in the top left magenta tengu yeah man that that magenta <laughs> color for whatever <laughs> reason the terran players just love magenta you know in fact actually i like that color too but because terror picks it all the time i don't pick it just because i don't want people to be like oh this is terran and you know it's not i mean even artosis is uh, magenta terran yeah i'm pretty sure uh, Tengu, again, just to hype him up, um, he is, I mean, you know, talking about players making it into the ASL, this guy, he, he works hard, man, and he plays a lot, he grinds a lot, it kind of reminds me of, remember when Ivory, uh, last season, I think, the Zerg who qualified, the amateur Zerg who qualified for ASL kind of came out of nowhere? That guy apparently he turned off his stream for like a month straight and just grinded nonstop every day to make it through the qualifiers and that's the kind of level of commitment you need to uh, give in order to reach this kind of skill level and Tengu he's got like 10 different accounts that are in like the top 10 you know <laughs> like that kind of player I mean I'm exaggerating a bit but uh, of the latter so this guy's always always playing. Yeah, that's the kind of commitment that you need. You know, this is a once in a lifetime potentially, uh, potentially thing. So you gotta make the most of it. And we do see actually best going to find Tengu first with his vertical scout. We actually have a 12 gas. 11 gas is becoming more and more meta these days, but we're gonna be playing uh, pretty much by the book right now. Also, one of the signs that we saw in the crowd was white clan fighting. And I had forgotten that actually best is in the white clan because you never actually see him repping that tag but yeah uh you know with him being in the white clan i guess there could be some dynamics where they have played versus each other a decent amount yeah you know for those who don't know clans uh these guys basically 
it's kind of a social thing. They also probably have like, you know, a cow cow group. And uh, I think even the pros that are involved in these clans are generally some, you know, sometimes actually help out other members. So, but obviously uh, these days, the, the known pros often, you know, the streamer gods kind of, they rep their university tags, which is a whole other thing. If you haven't heard about the whole university sis uh, system. So that being said, so far the game is super standard. Uh, Best did not opt to go for a Nexus first. Tengu did not opt to go for a Rax expand. So both players kind of believing in their skill. I mean, generally these the Nexus first and the Rax expand options are higher variance options. So, but they can give you a nice edge if you can get away with them. So in my mind, when you don't go for them, you're feeling really confident. Yeah, I just keep, I just was noticing the factory timing, kind of, kind of slow. But also, the Protoss player did scout quickly, so it kind of makes up for that. In fact, I'm looking to see: Are we going to have the three marine expand or the two marine expand? It is going to be three marine expand. Goon was, ra is there a zealot because or a second goon? Because okay, that's a pro. I was like, dude, how did he get two goons out? Yeah, we've been seeing this uh, more often these days. This bunker just going down as a precaution. You know, before I think uh, the philosophy, well, you know, in general the philosophy is can we try and get the command center up as soon as possible. So this bunker might be, you know, might seem like a bit of a misstep in terms of optimization, but it's just really safe. It kind of prevents any kind of sneaky zealot that maybe Tengu, since he scouted top right first with his SCV, uh, he might have missed. And actually that's a citadel there. Citadel, man. I don't know about this. Heron players have been really good with laying mines like all yeah. over the place, not just outside of Protoss' base, but also on the pathway. Also, Heron players lay it in front of their bunker, even sometimes behind their bunker. So I'm not too sure how this is going to pan out. I actually hope that this is not just walking the DT across the map. I hope this is going to be DT dropped, and there is the yeah. robo. Yeah, these days you don't really see uh, raw dog DTs because the openings from Terran involve, like you mentioned, just pushing out, getting one tank only and three vultures, and then just mining everywhere. And you get mines, you know, precautionary mines even in front of your base, just in case there's DTs. It covers DTs, like walking DTs very well. But the way that Best is doing it, I like it. He's rushing the DTs. You can poke out with the first one. If it dies, then at least you have the option to fall back in a DT drop. But in any case, DT drop is kind of the mainstay now, the meta in terms of getting DTs in this matchup because it allows you the flexibility of getting that robotics, which means you can actually get observers and kind of play a very standard game. There's a super gimmick way of playing DTs, which is just rushing DTs and just going straight Stargate Arbiter. But often when you do that, you lose complete map control because essentially you have no way of dealing versus mines. So this is like a very safe, like it's a very safe way to play as Protoss. And it catches a lot of these two factory tank like pushes. Yeah, if this was a two fact push, I mean, it would just do nothing. Uh, DT drop though is kind of a big commitment if you do spend a lot of money on your tech, but I have been watching best manage his eco at his natural you can see just now he's going to be getting his gas so he hasn't completely you know obliterated his mineral income so he'll be able to transition out of this just fine whether this does damage or not but you can see he does seed a lot of map control like i was talking about and there is the minefield set up the question though is is there a turret in the main this was ebay uh, this was fact one fact armory eBay and there he goes so he is going to have turrets in time but does it cover his entire base yeah I'm not sure there's a mine already there it's one turret so he can die to two DTs uh, very easily uh -oh. and Tengu still doesn't know if it's DT or Reaver yeah but he has no turret by the army man oh no he's going to yeah the armory and he this was somewhat of a quick armory it was like a 445 armory so this was pretty damn fast he's about a minute and a half along into his upgrades almost halfway done and he's gonna lose this unless he can somehow save it 
Oh my god, he's glitching all his SCVs. That's how that happens when you try and spam the repair like that, and the armory goes down. That's massive. That's huge. That Upgrades is, are so important, man. Yep, that is huge. You know, actually these days getting just one one upgrades is kind of meta, so maybe this can be playable, but this is rough. Yeah, and not not just the armory going down, but one depot as well. I would say, actually, this damage is acceptable for Terran. It's really annoying that you lost the armory, obviously. Um, if anything, actually, he yeah, as Terran, you might consider even going double armory yet. And yeah. if he did, he would basically catch up on his 1-1 one -one timing. Uh, but Protoss sacrificed a lot for this. I mean, it's 8 minutes. There's no third base. Only now is he going to go and clear that mine. So, honestly, I think this was good for Terran. Well, I don't know about that because the Harbor Tribunal is already yeah, halfway done. But but I agree that delaying the third base is you know does not put or having the third base delayed so long. I think this is definitely a playable position. If you look at the supply, it's 81 to 71. But the fact that you've lost your plus one timing, you lost your you know your factory flood timing, uh, it's going to be really hard to do anything to punish this fast harbor. I like the response of going for the fast command center because I don't think Vest can punish it. But that Stargate already blinking. Yeah, DT drop creates a really interesting dynamic because often the optimal response from Terran is to just expand immediately, just three command center. Especially these days, the meta, like we've been kind of talking about, well, you hinted at it today, uh, we've spoken about this uh, in the previous two days of the ASL, it has been this 1-1 one, one push style where, well, basically, Terran delays their star port until plus one armor is halfway done rather than plus one weapons, and it creates a super interesting, like, aggressive dynamic in the mid game. But this type of opening from best, a DT drop into Arbiter Rush, completely shuts that down. So it will force Tengu to play a longer game. Protoss, though, after this DT drop, can't be overly aggressive. They don't really have anything to be aggressive with. It's mostly just goons. There's no shuttle tech. There's no... Uh, there's nothing. So this is why it's so good for Terran to just flat out expand here. He is going to try and get this third base. There's a lot of stuff here for Protoss to... Oh, there's a DT. Let's snipe down the tank. One for one. Not bad. Oh, here we go. The Vultures were out of position for a second. And uh, Best tries to jump on this immediately. He gets two tanks. That's a good trade just for a couple of Zealots. Ooh, can't lose the goons, though. Dude, Tango's playing really well, man. He's yes. keeping his supply out up. He's expanding. He's not feeling... He's not getting intimidated by basically a Protoss army that is goon no speed zealot um and he took his expansion relatively fast sometimes you can even get it like on location against dt drop so that could have been slightly better but this game you know it was just so annoying having his armory snipe but now he's in a good spot man i think he can play this out and protoss also just on three base no fourth base just yet protoss's economy is definitely not as high as it usually is at this stage in the game but dealing with these Arbiters is going to be annoying, especially when they're so early. The threat of recall is very real. Yeah, and I did want to point out uh, spawn positioning. You know, in general, when I play, I feel like horizontal spawn, vertical spawn, you know, they're pretty much identical. But I think in this actual situation, my opinion is Pengu got really good spawns. He's able to get yeah. his third base yeah. easily. He can get his fourth base, I think, somewhat easily. And because of this tiny uh, bridge towards bottom left, I actually don't think Best can ever get that third base at the left side. So I feel like if we can get to mid game and late game and not die to recall man, I actually really do like Tengu's position, but the first Arbor's already out. It's banking energy, and we still don't know whether it's gonna be a stasis buster or a recall, but my experience on Radeon, recall seems to be the move. Yeah, I mean, uh, top level, top level Terrans, they're very good at mining, you know, their mains and their expansion. So often you don't necessarily see recall be used too much. But again, with how fast the Stargate was, it's hard for Terrans to know, like, are you going to bust my front? Are you going to go for a recall? You need mines everywhere, basically. 
and you need to keep your supply up. But I totally agree with you, Nyuk, and I think these these spawns are really good for Terran. I think if uh, Best was at top right, it would be really hard for Terran to play this uh, to play this map, or if maybe Best was bottom right, expanding towards top right. But given this specific spawns, I mean, it's clear what Tengu's plan is. Eventually, he'll take this 12 o'clock, and if need be, he will expand to top right. But, I mean, he's setting himself up, especially when you get this really fast third, you can get a really nice 2-1 push. And that can end the game in itself if, if executed correctly. So we'll see what he can do. Recall is going to be the play. There's no turrets there, by the way, between the Nat and this rally point. And we're going to get in there, man. I don't think this is stasis. Yep, here comes the recall. And I've had this happen on Radeon. Oh my god, he has nothing there. And his vultures are out of position. Yeah, he's, he's micro-ring Oh. Uh... And it's going to be a recall. Hello. There was nothing in the main. No mines, no anything. I, I guess at least the Turk is taken down. But look at the army's going to get blown up again. I mean, to be fair, though, the Protoss are I, The SimCity is really cooperative with Terran. I, I think he only sniped the one armory. And these trades are not the best for Protoss. Uh, but, okay, I don't know which armory that was. If it was the plus two one or if it was the plus one armor one. But you never want to, and now actually as the recall lingers, it's getting a bit better trades. The thing is, Terran needs to have mines, man. That's the only way you deal with recall, is having random mines there, pick off Protoss units, making it more inefficient. Tengu is getting some counterplay with this drop, double tank and vultures, but Bess is dealing with it really well, and now the supply is kind of plummeting here for Terran. So far, the last minute has been really good for Protoss. Yeah, I like the the multitask, but it's really hard to multitask a drop plus vulture support plus this a recall in your main. So a little, maybe a little bit too much uh, going on for Tengu to handle. And now what was a 20 supply lead is all of a sudden a 40 supply lead. And this is rough now because Protoss is about to be on five base. Yes, he lost one Arbiter, but he should have at least two more and they're going to have energy also. So an incoming recall could be on the menu in the next few seconds and in fact there it is yeah the follow-up recall and again no mines in tango's base he's being a bit too proactive with his units he's trying to harass he's trying to be out on the map but really he should just be keeping his units oh. in nice emp actually that was huge yeah, that, that was, was massive that would have been a game ender for sure yeah i i agree i think that would have completely blown this game wide open one thing to point out is i've noticed tango has not built any goliath like actually zero yeah so he's gotta be careful about that because even if uh there's a recall if you don't kill the arbiter he's coming back for more man so i'm hoping yeah. to see some goliaths pretty soon but we're approaching max for best and we're actually getting very close to max for tengu he may be feeling confident to take his fourth base and there he goes he puts it on location yeah, putting it on location is okay. You can cancel it if Protoss goes there, but uh, it is taxing in terms of multitask for Protoss or attention span for Protoss to go there uh, in general. So he might get away with it. And unfortunately, the only thing, honestly, that's kind of annoying for Terran is he lost his armory twice this game. If he hadn't, then his upgrade cadence would be so good that I wouldn't be I wouldn't mind him being at 160 supply. He'd probably be. Uh, he'd easily be 2-1 by now, almost at 3-2, given the, the start. But unfortunately, he's just at 1-1. And that really hurts him. That really hurts his efficiency in these fights. And Protoss has really good upgrades. So now Protoss also getting Storm and has Stasis. It's going to be very difficult to fight against this. And now uh, Tengu's Command Center gets canceled and he doesn't have one in production here to lift. So it's hurting, man. Yeah, he's feeling the pressure now, and now he's going to try and move out onto the map, but there's a huge minefield in front of him. He's got to be very careful, yeah. because if Protoss sees you stepping on a minefield, it's go time, baby. We're not screwing around. And that Arbiter has double stasis, so he can make sure that he stasis the ones in the back and ensure that the ones in the front can't retreat. Now, that is a lot of gateways. There's like 12 gate on the left side, 10 gate on the right side. Okay, actually, Best doesn't jump on it immediately. Yeah, I mean, okay, he gets a stasis, but that was good for Terran to trade the, the vessel for the stasis. And uh, you're right, uh, Tengu really needed to clear that minefield, but luckily for him, Pronos is not taking engagement there. 
And uh, slowly creeping up here to the fourth base. Protoss is maxed. He is going to go for a trade, at least. He wants to get rid of some of the supply and max on a better composition. Nice EMP. The second Arbiter also has no energy. This is a good fight uh, for Terran, though. A lot of the Zealots are getting on top of these tanks. Finding some nice trades for Protoss. You can see, but Terran's not dead yet. I mean, that's good for him. Yeah. And that was a pretty good fight. It goes in favor of Tengu, but I am not sure if that was a canceled command center. So another big loss. We're approaching the point in the game where mains and naturals get mined out. So it's critical that he can get this base up and running pretty soon because Best, he's still got six bases, man. He's about to take bottom right. I also see something at top right. I'm not sure if that's actually a probe, but he could potentially start trying to take three quarters of the map. Yeah, Bess is just such a monster. He's been playing uh, super cleanly this game and kind of just checking Terran the entire time. And every single check he's done has basically put Terran slightly behind. And honestly, Tango's playing really well, uh, given everything we've been talking about so far. But just every, you know, the game has been hiccup for him time and again. Armory is getting cancelled, the recall is going off, the trade's being decent for Protoss. So he is a bit behind, he still has some work to do, but he's in this game, man. We've got, we're going to have a big engagement here, and I think maybe the stasis or the, the siege was a little bit late. Oh, the um, drop, and he catches 10 tanks. He's able to blanket all of them, and that's going to be the majority of the army of Tengu falling. All the key pieces of the army are gone, and that was the fight that Best was looking for. That's all it takes there. Just not the best engagement. Most of the tanks were clumped. Really, what's hurting Tengu also is just these upgrades. They are awful. Uh, we're still at 1 1 18 minutes in. From an opening where, again, DT drop kind of forces Terran into upgrade Terran, you can't really go that uh, 5 fact 1 1 style that we've been seeing so far. So, usually 3 2 in those situations finishes around. 16 minutes uh, and where uh, I mean look at Protoss's upgrades 3-2 and only now this 2-1 finish but that's not really strong against Protoss's upgrades like Protoss upgrades also matter in this matchup Best is just ahead of the curve the entire game yep and this is another maxed army for Protoss he's gonna try and just end it right here it's a 70 supply lead so this is a considerable amount uh, to overcome there's also Templars here there's the stasis and the issue now is just losing all the tanks. There's no backbone to your army. You can see that the Zealots just run rampant, the goons run rampant, and I feel like we're gonna see the GG any moment. Yeah, and that's a GG. Tengu taps out best, takes it, and honestly, good effort there from Tengu. It's, <laughs> I don't know how to put this in very few words, how to share this experience, but I think that's uh, pretty much par for what you could expect, TVP against a top-notch, you know, gatekeeper, basically. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think Tengu actually recovered really well. Like, if you think about all the disasters that happened in the game, lost our armory, DT drop took a long time. I guess we did deny the third base for a while. Then we got recalled. Then we got... Uh, then we lost our armory again, right? Like, there was multiple disasters, and he was still not out of it. Like, he, if he could have gotten his fourth base and not lost all of his tanks, we could have gone split map scenario. Of course, playing split map versus a macro god like Best or Shuttle or somebody like that is going to be really hard to, to, hard to do unless you're light. But it did seem like he recovered quite well for how the game unfolded in the initial stages. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, TVP, it's one of those, I mean, it, it's kind of a, well, we're going to go into a break soon, actually. So I will save the rant until then. But, uh, you know, pretty good game to open up today. Yep. So we should be going into a break in a moment. And then we'll be back with Action versus Sock. Oh, I forgot this. We got the highlight. So actually, this move out, when when this happened, I was looking at the supply and I was thinking like, wow, maybe this is our time. But I think it was a little bit too early simply because we don't have our fourth base. If there, if we had our fourth base economy set up, you know, maybe. But it was still yeah. a really good engagement because Best saw him move and there was no hesitation. Like, those tanks were barely in siege by the time Protoss was on top of him. Yeah, Terran could have taken his time a bit more. And it's very risky to just clump up all your tanks like that. There's a kind of a method to, well, whatever. Break time, guys. <laughs>
Alrighty, we are back and we're about to get into match two, which is going to be action versus sock. But of course, we have our promotion first. I still don't know exactly what they're promoting. Uh, it, it's definitely some type of battery. Maybe Jinjin can clarify what it was or what it and, is. Uh, either some battery or a fax machine, as we all need them in 2024. Yeah, in uh, that previous game, and I was going to say uh, that was a good effort from Tengu. I think TVP, it's the kind of matchup that you always just need some practice to get to that consistent level. Um, if you're a beginner in StarCraft, it's going to be one of the most miserable experiences. But honestly, that keeps going up until even this level. Tengu just needs to... I think he played fine, but probably just needs a couple more games and these situations and this, uh, you know, and playing in front of an audience, etc., to refine it and do better next time. But it was a good effort. Action versus Sock. Well, we've been talking about how Sock has had difficulty in this matchup. Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, he hasn't had a Zerg win in what is it, 14 seasons, but we also aren't really aware of how many games he's actually played versus Zerg. You know, if he hasn't had a win, but he's only played one Zerg, I mean, okay, that's that's a that's a different story, right? But it's kind of a half truth right there. Um, I liked how you pointed out how if you're a, a new Terran player, it's going to be a miserable experience, and then as you get better, it's still a miserable experience. <laughs> Does it ever not become miserable? Well, once you become light, it is, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, but it is very fulfilling once you can play it. And I, Tengu obviously can play the matchup, but again, it, it goes, of course, I, I know some people will be triggered. Oh, it's the Terran players whining, but I, just trying to share the experience with everyone out there. Um, I think it was a good effort and I think he, he will only get better from that. So he should be, you know, proud of himself. But uh, still has a game to play. He is going to be facing the loser of whoever loses here. Action, 60% win rate in the matchup. He is an absolute monster in general in the ASL. I mean, his results have been incredible. We're getting a look at Sox stats. And you can see the versus Zerg win rate is not exactly the greatest. But this is kind of what I was talking about. You know, if he hasn't had a win since season three i mean he hasn't really even played that many games versus uh, but this i imagine should be a good matchup like you were saying sock is a skt terran and anybody knows when they hear skt terran <laughs> harassment based style potentially so there could be some wraith play there could be you know mass drops there's definitely gonna be a lot of multitask because in general these terran players have insane multitask but uh, I do know Sock is definitely a Wraith player in TVT, so I wonder if he will actually try and attempt something like that uh, in TVZ versus Action here. Yeah, game's ready. Players are in the lobby. They're about to do start the countdown, rather. So let's get into it. Game number two of Group C, Action versus Sock. Okay, in the bottom left, our blue zerg. It is action. <laughs> I don't know what that shrug is about. Top right sock in the teal. You know what's funny is uh, the game has become so optimized that I think uh, action probably mismined slightly one of the mineral patches or something, and he's already annoyed. So uh, <laughs> it does matter, guys. I mean, you know, zergs want to consistently hit that one minute. Basically, you want to be able to put down a pool at one minute, so you should have at least 200 minerals at that point, uh, etc. There's all these benchmarks that all the players use, and uh, you kind of practice to hit them. And you really, I mean, even the the order, the, the thing is the, the minerals these days have become standardized on both the right and left side. So it's not as complicated as it might sound. Like once you learn the pattern, that's it, you're set. But there's a set pattern. You have to mine the minerals in a set, you know, uh, order one, two, three, four, five, and place the workers at a specific place. But so there's a lot going into this early game, is what I'm trying to get at. And I'm not surprised to see a uh, you know a player sigh here or there in the opening yeah. seconds. 
And it can be a big deal because, like, let's say you mess up your pool. Let's say you're going a nine pool, right? And you mess it up, and it's five seconds late. Maybe yeah. there's a, a, a world where Heron, like, nails it. He crushes it. He boosts his minerals even faster than before. A lot of times when you're doing a nine pool, you only run into two Marines. If Terran hits their build and you miss yours, I guess there's a scenario where Terran Damn. has three Marines. Oh, Look at that guy, man. Look at that absolute first shot. shot. First shout out to, to me and our co-caster on the cast. I can't believe it. I don't think anybody's ever put a sign up in ASL for the StarCast TV casters. Thank you, man. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the first time I've ever experienced something like that too man i'm i'm really uh, grateful thank you man much love to you make sure to uh, uh write in the comments who you are we'll give you a massive shout out big hugs from us uh but uh yeah man <laughs> I can't really he's, he was he was, saw that oystein tournament man the odd odds the <laughs> oystein tournament he's like wow. I like this Nio Jim. I mean, I wonder who it is. Like, you know, the community is very small. I'm sure we know who that is. Uh, maybe if someone can let us know. But, ah, uh, goddamn, man, that's uh, that's the world we live in. Already a lot of developments, though. Sock, he didn't go for a wall in. Um, I've seen, you know, we've seen Action Five pool, so maybe he thought Action would do something crazy in this opening game. Uh, but alas, that is not the case. Also, I was going to mention Sock has been the pioneer of the 111, but it's just so hard to do that style these days, uh, given the fact that Zerg rushes Lair so fast. You know, the 2.5 hatch has, the 2.5 hatch meta has completely shut that down. So Sock, he has to play his standard style, and without a wall here, he can't go into something like Mech. So we'll see, man. Is he up to scrap the play action? I mean, action ZVT is, is, infamous it's legendary it's it's up there i think it goes well i mean it's hard to contest with soul Peak and and soma but after those two it's definitely sock especially or it's definitely action especially since queen has been having a hard time uh, recently yeah well we do have two racks is a somewhat quick academy it is not going to be plus one i actually really did think it was going to be plus one because it, of it being cross spawn but instead it is just going to be like a 335 academy so they're going to have rushed upgrades but no plus one weapon so i'm actually guessing that this could be a rushed factory as a follow-up you know players like royal and yeah. seasons have been experimenting with just two racks in the factory i think the more common move is three racks in the factory but we'll see what sock wants to do with this yeah, you're totally right. Uh, there are ways of rushing your factory. Basically, it involves essentially just putting down your factory before using that gas for marine range, but that can be very risky. And uh, we'll see. Usually, I mean, it is an option against 2.5 hatch since the spire is a bit later. You can see that action actually already has that third hatchery in his main. Sock has lost an SEV scout and he opts to go for a rescout which is risky that's another scv that you commit out on the map against link speed it can very easily be caught but luckily for him it will not and it's gonna go around spotting for a possible third hatch and this to me indicates that i think sock won't necessarily rush that factory maybe he's looking to push out and be aggressive Anytime I see Terran with no SimCity at all with their natural and they're just out there with like eight Marines, I get very nervous because if if action had just done what Larva likes to do, which is get speed and get 12 lings and A move, this army could have been dead. But action yeah. is going to run in and try and get into the main. Stim just now completes that micro. Actually pretty good from Terran. However, the ling does get in and confirm what's going on and i think that yeah that is a factory yeah that's that's a uh, factory before range 520 so super fast tech from sock sock uh for some reason he's also pushing out on the map which is crazy man we're not gonna have range on our marines for a long time these marines just being out here uh they're kind of sitting ducks uh especially again you need range to fight against mutalisks yeah, I wonder if Action will realize that this was a cut range. Because if he does, then these mutas are... Oh, absolutely. Same absolutely, he saw it. Yeah, he knows. There's there's so many games that I've had where I move out on the map, and I have a huge army. I'm like, well, you're dead, dude. And then I, we fight, and my army gets absolutely blown up. And I'm like, what happened? I have more units than I had you know, in the previous game. And I look back, and it's because I don't have range. So this is a massive 
massive upgrade that action can exploit. Yeah, so we'll have to see. I mean, of course, the Marines aren't completely useless, especially in these numbers. Only six Mutas, they don't really trade that well. You know, when you go in for that hold position, it's not the most amount of damage. And that is like a control group of Marines. So they can definitely fight off these Mutas and buy some time. But uh, Sock, he's playing really well. He's got a lot of turrets here. The Marines are out. It is going to force the Zerg to respect him. Uh, the factory's already finished. Starport is on the way. The problem is, this looks scary, but if Terran ever loses these units, oh boy, is he in for a lot of trouble. Yeah, he has no map presence after that because he's on two racks. It's different if you're on four or five rack. So it is imperative that he keeps this army alive. And that's why you see Action really trying to whittle down this army. Because he knows once this is gone, like he's free to do whatever he wants. Now, this was interesting. It's going to be a tank Valkyrie push. And we saw this a couple seasons ago yeah. when Royal and Rush did it in games that they were way far down. So it's a really strong push, and they actually ended up winning those games because of how powerful the push was. Yeah, this is the timing though for Mutalisks. He's got a whole group there, and they're gonna do a lot of damage. And, you know, again, Terran doesn't have that many Raxes and not that many units to deal with this, so... We'll see how much damage uh, Action can find. He's still on that Mutaling production, actually going straight into the Hive. And this tank Valkyrie timing might do a lot of work. It was a very effective style for a while, especially against this prolonged uh, 2.5 hatch where they're just relying on Mutaling to fight the Valkyries, basically effectively shut down the Mutalisks. One is already out. Yeah, and as soon as he can get even just one more and then a couple tanks, this push is going to be on the move. I was getting a little scared for action because he hadn't hit the SCV line like the entire game, kind of like what happened in the Zealot um, C game. But now that he's whittled down a few SCVs and some Marines, um, you know, he stalled the push a little bit. We can see that the third base is up and running for action. He also rushed an evolution chamber as soon as he saw the factory. So he will have plus one armor pretty soon. Yeah, action buying so much time with these links and the mutalists. Really good movement from him. It's really annoying to deal with this as Terran, and you don't really want to come back because then you miss your timing. Now, this isn't the scariest push because there are no tanks with this. Sock um, just pushing out on the map here, but action actually doesn't have no any lurkers. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna work. The sun can set up at both bases. Like you said, there's no tank. I can't believe there's no tank. What happened to the to the tank? He has the add-on. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of medic marine though, and because the mulas can't actually engage into these Valkyries, I don't know. This looks very scary for Zerg. It's so strange. I mean, he did get the machine shop, so I, I wonder what happened. And now he actually lost all his Valkyries. So all of a sudden, uh, this push <laughs> lost the, its steam entirely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, that's where all crazy are go for action. It's yeah. It's gonna be crazy. Their cultural is coming, and Saki needs to win the game like in the next five minutes. I I I don't know how you're gonna play in the crazy are with low tech or, or rush tech. You lost all your Valkyries. He's actually going into Vulture, nice. so we can have a mech switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, well. It's now making a lot of sense. But uh, hold that thought. Does so uh, does action commit here? No, he does not. He'll just pick off another Valkyrie. I mean, okay. So Sock is doing that mech transition that we saw, especially popular when Nemesis was in the map pool and Light Pioneer. This basically, you go into five, six Valkyries, and they completely shut down the airplay, which shuts down Mutalisk, sh shuts down drop play. And that kind of allows you to play mech. And uh, it's a nice style. It's a very difficult style. But I think it suits Sock. Unfortunately, he lost all his Valkyries, man. Like, he needed to have all these Valkyries alive. Yeah, losing all the Valkyries is massive. And now he's going to get countered. And I, I think Action's going to commit to this. No, Action he still runs away. But I think just showing the Vulture probably signals to Action that this is going to be a mech switch. I'm actually kind of surprised he hasn't attempted to take another base, but this is still going to be really rough for Sock because Ultras are on the way, he has no tanks, he doesn't have his factories even completed. An A move with plus two armor on the Ultras could maybe just flat out end the game. 
Yeah, Sock, I, I think this game just didn't really go in his uh, favor at all. Uh, action basically hasn't been pressured, uh, has just sat there, and somehow the Mutalisks traded against Valkyries, which is the whole point of getting the Valkyries is to shut down these Mutalisks, but he, he bled them out. And uh, Sock, given his build, I was looking to see him do a really nice kind of tank Valkyrie push, but he never built those tanks. He tried to push out too early, and especially against this style that Action is doing, he didn't need to go that early. He could have waited for tanks. Like, Ultra's just now popping out, but even now, let's say you had three tanks alive sieging, the Ultras don't really do that much. So, really, Terran had way more time than, than he used, and now he's in a rough spot because... The Ultras are going to be really well upgraded. These Marines are basically completely worthless out in the middle of the map once the Ultras get the Carapace upgrade and the Speed upgrade. And then from there, Sock, I mean, playing Mech from two bases is very hard. Oh, and I keep seeing uh, Valkyries get built. You know, my opinion on Valkyrie play is like as soon as you start building more than three, you're just crippled because every Valkyrie could have been a factory if you think about it. Like, we're on four factories, but we could be on like six or seven, but we are not able to do that because we built, I think, seven Valkyries now, and still the Mutas are alive. We're st still alive. We're still not able to get any damage done with the Valkyries. Yeah, well, the, the concept surrounding this, this play from Sock is he needs these six, seven Valkyries to shut down the airplay, but the problem is that he lost so many Valkyries in the mid game, uh, and it de it's delayed and you're rightfully, you, you, I mean, you're totally right, Nyokin. It is a huge investment. It is a lot of minerals. It is a lot of gas. It's very expensive and it slows everything down. So the fact that he's basically had to make 10 vaults total this game has completely crippled his build on top of the fact that he did not put any pressure onto the Zerg. So Zerg's had smooth sp sailing this entire time. Meanwhile, Terran's struggling to get to this third base and here comes the Ultra Fuzz. There's no tanks, man. Yep, that's the thing is he has no tank. Actually, Sock has done a really good job to lay mines all over, but all it takes is one ultra clearing the way, and here we are. SCVs try and get pulled off to hold the ramp. There is three tanks out, but the ultra, of course, he gets into the sweet spot. He's going to probably take down all three tanks by himself, and like you were saying, the Marines, they're basically just dead supply. They only have plus one weapon. These yeah. ultras have plus four armor, so Marines are going to do almost no damage. Yeah, the Marines were totally out of position, and even if they were in position, I mean, look, they're doing nothing. They're tickling these Ultras, getting completely obliterated. Sock, GG's out, and man, action made that look easy. Yeah, and it is not easy to run into the amount of Valkyries that Sock had, but action did a really good job to catch isolated Valkyries, whittle them down to one or two, and then pick them off, and then all the momentum is just completely down the drain for Sock's build. I would have to re-watch uh, when he started building his Valkyries, because like we were saying, where's the tank? Like maybe he was supply blocked at that point and he had to make a decision, do I build a tank or build a Valkyrie? Of course you're going to build a Valkyrie in that scenario because the mutas are still in the air, but yeah. Yeah, very strange. I mean, um, I, I, I really don't know. I, I can't tell you. I can't answer you. I think uh, the Valkyrie timing was perfect. You know, he got that factory super early. I think the build was fine yeah. up until eight minutes where he decided to push out onto the map with just Marine Medic, Valkyrie, and then the Valkyries kind of started getting picked off in the middle of the map. Honestly, when you play this style as Terran, you just have to commit to that tank push. You know, you're just like, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to play slow, build up my tanks, get two, three plus the Valkyries and then go. You can't compromise. You can't just be like, oh, no, I actually forget these tanks. I don't need them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Sock's game plan just completely unraveled after that. Yeah, well, Action nailed uh, his build. Like, as soon as he spotted that it was going to be fast tech, he instantly rushed plus one. I guess, you know, these players play versus each other so much that he may have had a read like, okay, anytime he does a two racks tech, it's mech switch. And if you can get ultras this quickly into a mech switch, you don't have any of your upgrades on your mech. And, you know, Mech is really strong once they, once they reach 2-1. And Terran just never had that. So it was a really good timing from Action with his Ultras. And he secures the win. And this does set us up for what I would say was the anticipated matchup of the group. It's going to be a rematch of Action versus Best from previous seasons. 
and they've always had epic games. Yeah, and I think we're going to be going into a break shortly here. Um, super excited for this next match, but we'll be right back, guys. I didn't think so. I thought that we were going to have the well new chair. Oh my god, wait, you're good. Yeah, I've only I've only had this scenario happen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times in the past and here we are again. I'm still learning, man. Still yeah. learning the ropes, man. I'm yeah, I'm the new guy. It's hard to remember all these uh transitions. Transitions, yeah. Yeah, we got to learn the production build order, man. Well, I have to learn the production builder. You're you clearly having a lockdown. <laughs> the well new chairs. Man, I'm I'm gonna order one right now. I bet you are. Absolutely. Uh, Amazon.ca. Uh, um, but um let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. What kind of pizza are we eating this morning? Oh, I was about to mention I, I think I think after your comment last week, how I was talking about how I had pizza and fries and, you know, biscuit, you're like carb overload, right? And I saw the chat. Yeah, I don't know what you, no, you were talking about how you're eating fries and rice oh, on no, your pizza. No, no, no. With I, had, I had a, I had red, lo red lobster shrimp and fries and rice and buttermilk biscuit. I remember. As before. you do. Yeah. Yeah. As, as you do. I remember somebody in the chat mentioning like what is not doing this this is crazy this is too many carbs i think we're gonna yeah. dial it back a little bit man yeah well you know whatever makes you whatever floats your boat man whatever makes you happy there's nothing wrong with eating mashed potatoes and rice i mean you could put the rice into the mash that sounds you know and put some cheese in there too mm -hmm. uh maybe you can put some nuts in there too grind some nuts pistachios on top sprinkle that and then put your shrimps on there well you're uh, all about that nutrition man everybody sees you on stream they want to know how they can get swole like the big jit what's what do you what's, mean what's, dude half the no absolutely not. absolutely not half the time i get uh noodle arm comments oh yeah <laughs> yes i missed that yeah well what can I say, man? Um, yeah. So, well, so what are you gonna eat for breakfast today? Have you been eating breakfast? Are you gonna go back? Okay. Are you gonna go back to sleep? Yeah, I'm gonna go back to sleep, even though I rested well last night. It still wasn't enough. Getting up at four is really rough, man. Like in the fall season of ASL, it's not so bad because you wake up at like five thirty, which is yeah, manageable. But getting up at four. I feel miserable for a second, but then I remind myself it is to cast ASL with Nyokin, and all of a sudden I'm excited. Yeah, all of a sudden you you got that adrenaline going. Down. Yeah, I pushed. Yeah, absolutely. My uh, animal instincts kick in. I start frothing at the mouth. I know I got to go cast some Starcraft, yeah. and I go downstairs, start the coffee machine at four thirty, as you do. Drink my coffee. Log on, play some last epoch. Yeah. Getting my mental reps in, it, you know, it just fires my brain up. And then uh, I'm here, dude. You are here. You even get up and message me before I message you, which is unusual. A lot of times. Yeah, it's true. Out. You're always messaging me first. Yeah, the, usually the co casters that I work with, they're, uh, they're there, but it ends up being uh, me messaging them first. Well, oh, are we going? Yeah. Break. I think we are. Look at the, the signal. Here we go. Be back soon.
And we're back and about to get into our winner's match, which is going to be best versus action. Let's check the bands. We got a double Troy ban, and that means we have Citadel as our map selection. We actually haven't seen that many games on Citadel, so I'm excited to see. I think this is our first Protoss versus Zerg here. Yeah, absolutely. Get that trash out of here, Troy, I mean. And uh, no, <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's a fun map to watch, but... Uh... Uh, obviously, for PvZ especially, Troy, I think Terran actually, the Terran matchups, they're pretty standard on Troy. But for PvZ, it's a it's a headache because of those gases. Because essentially, Protoss and Zerg, they don't have early game, like their first units are not Marines. Uh, so if either player gets an advantage with Zealots or Lings, uh, Protoss opens often 2-gate on that map. Zerg often opens 9-pool. It can immediately snowball because if you essentially have more units, you can just kill the assimilators and force your opponent to play an island game, whereas you have access to the middle of the map. So the PVZs on that map have been kind of insane in that regard. Citadel is going to be it, though. Super standard map. Game is ready. Winners. Whoever wins here gets out of the round of 24. And in the bottom left, trying to bait me again, it is action. And in the top left, best. Well, I guess the real question to start us off is, you think best will be able to do a little bit better of a job of walling compared to C yesterday? You think he'll <laughs> nail his pylon positioning and gateway forward? I don't think uh, anyone's going to... The wall like C did ever again. Uh, that was a interesting move. I'm I'm still kind of confused of where the. Sometimes you just miss the depot, man. Yeah. You know, you just put it in the wrong spot. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, man. But uh, even walling these days, you know, I was I was talking about how the mineral layout has been standardized across all maps but even the natural layout has been kind of standardized across all maps most of the walls are all the same the philosophy on how you know what the walls should look like is kind of converging Terran for example in TVZ map makers and the players obviously agree that Terran should not be allowed to have a full link tight wall in so nowadays you often see naturals that basically have holes in them same for PVZ and uh, it's rare to see a, a player that's well-practiced kind of mess up their wall. So not going to happen here. Best is opening with a forge, though. The probe is already inside of Action's base. Actually, given the fact that this was a, a pool after Overlord, Best might be going for Nexus first, 12. I think it was going to be Nexus first. I like the probe positioning. He spotted the, the creep and stayed out of vision on the high ground. So if action was going to go for a 12 hatch, it's going to be now converted into a 12 pool. And now we're going to have that Nexus be put down. Yesterday, we saw the Protoss player not really delay the hatchery that much. And again, it really doesn't get delayed that much, but not the biggest of deals. It is going to be a forge follow-up for best, just like you said. Yeah, Protoss wants to keep the most amount of health on his probe. And this opening from Protoss is, is nice. I mean, it's a it's a flex opening. I think if Best had seen that that was a hatch first on the, his first scout, he would have went for the forge earlier and possibly would have cannon rushed, especially on these positions. There's definitely space behind the minerals. And uh, yeah, cannon out on time before the Zerglings hatch. No way that the Zerglings are getting there in time. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second, it's the curse. What's the curse? I mean, uh, Best uh, also screwed up his wall pretty severely. Yeah, I was thinking that. I was looking at that forge, and I'm like, dude, where do you put your gate? And he's going to put it in front that's, of the gate. That's, that's, really uh, that's extremely far forward. So all of a sudden, plays like 973 become way more viable. Uh, I think plays like a Ling Flood become way more viable. So it could come even earlier. Yeah, and action already making links. I mean, he sees this. There's no way we're not going for speed. We're not going to go in and check this uh, wall because basically Protoss needs 
the wall in order to prevent Lings from killing him. Yeah, and there's just a huge gap at the top. Yeah, look at this. He's even forced to build a second cannon, but of course, I think he saw action build eight Lings. There's no Zealot out, so these Lings could actually just try and win. And okay, it's just one cannon, man. He just walked. Uh, he in. gets in. Don't mind me. I'm in there. Well. That cannon did kill four Lings, but four Lings still alive inside of Best's main, already forcing gas off. And okay, I don't think action went for that lair most likely. So not going to be a Ling flood, but abusing the wall in another way, just guaranteeing that Ling run by. And this is a rough start for Protoss. Action is going to try and trade for that Zealot. It was good micro there from both sides actually, but the Zealot eventually will fall. And without the Zealot, Protoss's probes are very weak. Like Zeke Lings on crack, man. Four Lings versus one Zealot. Only one of the Lings died. And the only reason it died is because the probe was able to finish them off. They're going to come in again, and he is going to get another probe. That's great. We do have a counterattack of one Zealot. I think it was just now spotted. I mean, so far, our best is dealing with these Lings a lot, like, very well. Uh, just one probe went down, I think, maybe two, but that was eight Lings that bet that action committed early on as well. Uh, the earlier you build the Lings, the more it impacts your economy. So, best gets inside of Zerg's base with the Zealot. It is gonna trade decently well. Importantly, it also forced these Lings out, so those weren't drones. Honestly, Protoss' early game is going exceptionally well. Yeah, he's really hit his build. I thought his tech was going to be delayed longer than it was. Okay, we've got a Hydrogen with Lair oh. already completed. It is not exactly timed with the Lair, but this still could be something like a Lurker bus. Yeah, I think uh, it, it makes the most sense to me, right, Nyokin? I think that's got to be Lurkers. There's no other reason to go Lair into Hydrogen. And uh, usually you get the Spire, and then you go into... 5 hatch Hydra at the very least, 6 hatch. Uh, Corsairs, or Corsair on the way. Okay, another probe goes down. These Lings have been annoying, but they importantly haven't killed too many probes. They have hiccuped the gas income, but again, I think Bess has been dealing with it just fine. Hydra's already out on the map. That's a lot of Hydras, actually, so I don't think that's for Lurkers, Nyokin. Yeah, there's only one gas. And there's a Zealot at the third base, by the way, racking up a drone kill. So this may actually just be action trying to go for an all-in kill. The Sarah spots the Hydras, though, and he sees the amount that's coming. So he knows that this is definitely a committed attack. Needs to scramble to get more cannons down. I think he's at just two now, soon to be four. Yeah, I mean, it's very strange. I wonder if that lair was a bait. Uh, I don't think... You know, to kind of lure Protoss into a false sense of security, because now the Hydra Flood is coming, and this is a committed Hydra Flood. Four cannons finished, more on the way. Once these seven cannons warp in, there's no way that Zerg is busting this, but it looks like actually action has already transitioned into drone production. Fortunately for Best, he sees everything, so he'll be able to probably cancel that seventh... Or was that just pulling the drones off? Oh yeah, look, uh, Best already canceled... A cannon. Yep, that was a good reaction. Why is the zealot still here? He's just here, man. He's out of no, out of nowhere, sheriffing that third base, and this is just a disaster for action. A drone dies. He may even get another one. Yeah, a lot of damage by the zealot, slowing down the zerg tremendously. Uh, Zerg's early game just hasn't gone that well. That initial run by with the Lings was good, but then the four Lings that survived the cannon didn't really do that much damage. And then Bess with the move out, uh, with this first Zealot also essentially forced more Lings. And you can see that, you know, in the supply, Protoss is really far ahead. Not only did he build these cannons on time, but he already has four gates up and running. So he'll be able to pressure Zerg momentarily with plus one Zealots. And he's not overreacting with Corsairs. Like he doesn't have five or seven of them, like we've been seeing in a lot of the games. So he's going to have a lot on the ground. He has plus one weapon already done. And there's not even that many Hydras here. So they're going to have to be on a full retreat 
just to not die. But the Zealots are quicker, man. See you later. That one's gonna die. Yeah, Protoss uh, honestly is is in the driver's seat. This is a massive advantage for him. He's putting on so much pressure. The Corsair is also killing a lot of Overlords. Okay, the Hydra is now finally grouped, can ward off the initial group of Zealots. But, I mean, Protoss is, importantly, not only pressuring Zerg into making a lot of units. Zerg doesn't even have, is that six? I think he does have three hatches at his third base. But look at this. Protoss has so much space behind this to, one, make these Templars that are banking up energy. He's getting up to that six gate, seven gate count. Has a Dark Archon as well. This is best trademark, it seems like. And Zerg struggling to get the sixth patch. Zerg right now wants to get up to 45 drones. You know, that means having 12 drones at the minerals for each base and three on gas everywhere. And uh, will he have time? I mean, look at how many Hydras he's had to make. Yeah, I think he'll have time to get the eco he wants, but I think Bess is just going to get a really huge army, make his move out with Maelstrom plus Observer, and then just have an unstoppable force. He's already got a couple Templars banking up energy also, so he's going to have a ton of spells to deal with. Yeah, um, Bess is uh, basically setting himself up for a sick mid-game timing. As, you know, Protoss is doing this matchup, they need to get that strong mid-game army. Robotics already warping in here, so he will have observers momentarily. It is bordering on, you know, Zerg's lurker timing. Of course, Zerg just now finishing the drone cycles, and that's a lot of gateways. Yeah, I'm like, is that seems like more gates than there should be. You know, I was thinking to myself, you know, if there's some way that Zerg holds this attack, where does Protoss expand? Like, the mineral only is not exactly ideal. Mid left, you're expanding towards zerg that's gonna be pretty hard and then getting top middle that's light years away so i guess best is thinking like well i don't even want to play for mid game so let's just try and end it with a 10 gate yeah that's a good point and i guess we didn't really get into the map too much i i don't think uh, i've seen that many games either but this map on the surface to me looks incredibly hard for protoss to take an early third base um you know the mineral only is out in the middle of the map and it's a mineral only you don't get that gas so you want to expand to this gas but this one is also kind of way out there in terms of uh you know just just being far away and hard to defend so looks like it makes sense to me then that protoss is going for a mass gate flood first to get that strong mid game army and then potentially double expanding behind it, but 11 minutes honestly is very early for this Nexus. The way this is unfolding, it kind of seems like what Terran does in TVP, you build your five factories and then expand. Protoss doing kind of the same thing, build tons of gates more than usual, and now go expand. I was a little bit worried about these Hydras on the right side, because this Corsair spotted them, and I thought that Bess might take that opportunity to just jump on this lurker field at the left side with all the hydras out of position, but it never actually happened. Honestly, man, I really thought Zerg, I mean, I really thought Protoss had the better early game, but yeah. it, it just goes to show you how oppressive Zerg is in this matchup. It, it looks like Action has a nice run by here. He is gonna pick up these cannons, but does not kill the probes. My God, that storm almost hit his own probes with it. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, Zerg's seeing a lot of counterplay. This is the point in, in which uh, Zerg has a nice power spike. Look at how many Hydras are on the map. He can go hit every single uh, location at once and check the Protoss' multitask. Nice Maelstrom. Double Ma Maelstrom picks off a couple of these Hydras here. It's a good catch. Like, nine Hydras for free and an Overlord. Absolutely amazing. And supplies are <clears throat> pretty close. But the problem that I'm seeing is, how does Protoss attack? Okay, well, Zerg moved out of position, so maybe that's how you attack. Yeah, and you can see this is exactly what I was talking about. It is hard to hold on to this third base. Look at how much pressure Zerg is putting on. But so far, Bess is defending immaculately. His units are where they have to be. He's splitting up the Zealots to the top side to ward off these Hydras, though I think they're getting completely eaten up there. But at the same time, Bess cleaning up at the south side here. 
Oh man, look at how much pressure Zerg is putting on this third. Death can attack the third, can you know set up a contain outside of the natural. That's why you see Best trying to bounce back and forth because if the contain gets set up with mass lurkers, you're in big time trouble. But look how many hydras can just be built by Zerg. He's building like 15 hydras at a time. It's nuts. Uh, this map just seems so hard for Protoss because uh, he also doesn't have a fourth base to take really easily. Oh. Action coming from the south, coming from the north. Oh my gosh, those are amazing storms. That did tons of damage. And what was 20 supply differential is now a, almost a 40 supply differential. This could be the trade that Best was looking for that he can start snowballing the game. Yeah, Best, again, defending so well. And supplies now increasing for the Protoss, but importantly also his goon count is, is stable. You know, he hasn't really lost many goons, so now his army is pretty beefy. Does not land any storms, and on the high ground, the Hydras are going to tank a lot of these goon shots more efficiently, but no lurkers to support anymore. That's the big story here. Action lost a lot of his lurkers in those trades, and these Zealots then will have free reign. The goons now on the high ground, benefiting from that extra protection, and the two lurkers that just morphed immediately getting sniped. GG! Yep, that's, it. that's all best needed was he just needed that favorable engagement to swing the tides in his favor. What looked like was going to be a stranglehold for action, just a little bit too aggro with his moves, and Best capitalizes and takes the game. Yeah, not only takes the game, but he gets out in first place in this group. And honestly, I really think Protoss had a good opening there, uh, despite the, the wall, which... Turned out to be okay because the forge wasn't in range. You know, given the, the wall that Bess had, he had a cannon covering his forge. So it couldn't get picked off by the Hydras. So fortunately for him, um, you know, that happened. And I, I don't know, man. Despite that early kind of lead, I would say, for Protoss, Zerg looked menacing in the mid game. And I think I, I kind of attribute that to the fact that it, it is very hard for for protoss to take the third base because you can see how he has to be in between these two high grounds and zuri can kind of shark back and forth and uh but eventually protoss just built up this nice army and and kind of snowballed yeah that, that 10 gate production really kicking in for best and this is where it all started to go downhill uh or I, no maybe it was no, this was it. This is where all the storms land. And just yeah. the hy hydras and lurkers he gets. He didn't really lose anything. He lost, what was that, two goons? I mean, those are amazing trades for Protoss. Yeah, I mean, Zerg, especially with an 11-minute Nexus at the third base, Zerg feels ultra pressure to to attack that. Uh, the earlier Protoss gets their, their third, the more resources they have to work with, particularly because they don't mine out their main and that as fast. Uh, often in this matchup, you see Protoss actually taking a 14-minute third, kind of similarly to how Terran takes that in, in versus Protoss. Um, or at least a tw at least 12 minutes in, 12, 13 minutes in. And whenever you take it earlier than that, you get a huge eco boost uh, throughout the game because your, pro your probes are just more efficient. And uh, Action felt like he needed to be super aggressive, and it just didn't work out for him. Definitely did not, but what a recovery from action. I mean, we were talking about how it seems like Protoss is an amazing spot, and the next thing I know, I'm looking at even supplies. I just don't, I don't know how Zerg players do it. It's just absurd how scary they are, even though the early game doesn't go well for them. Yeah, and honestly, best dealt with that Ling run by uh, beautifully. I, I think a lot of players in that position, the game would have been over. You know, especially you get four lings inside of your main, man. That that can lead to complete disaster. Uh, Best didn't even have to build a cannon in his main. He just dealt with it uh, with Zealot and Pro Micro. And then both games today, his macro has looked on point. So really good performance from him. Yep, and Best has been on the rise, I think, the past two seasons now. Like, he's only in the round of 16, of course, so far. But he looks much better. In comparison to previous seasons, like a lot of times I've been seeing a best bomb out in like the round of 24, a round of 16. But it looks like we could potentially go round of eight, maybe even further this time around. Yeah. And uh, the trend for me has been that the first place finishers in this group have looked 
amazing in their games. Uh, of course it is best of one, so obviously if uh, a player comes in and just wins two games, it's not too telling. Uh, but they were really solid games from best. Yesterday mine had Immaculate games and the day before Bisu, I mean he did have that proxy to the gate, but I was I was just impressed with him pulling the trigger there in the best of one against light. So Yeah, just dominant performance from these guys Yep, really well done and that means we have what is it? Bisu and best for Protoss then we have hero light and, and mind and mind so we've got two Protoss, two terrans one zerg so it's destiny here that action makes it out right so we can have an even representation in the round of 16. yeah i mean most likely he will his cvt is just incredible if he plays sock again the first game between them it wasn't very convincing from socks uh point of view so but Sog will have to play Tengu here, TVT, in our next game. And that's going to be interesting. And that's going to be a very difficult challenge for Tengu. Because Sog, if there's one matchup he doesn't struggle in, it's TVT. Yeah, and what if, what if Sok doesn't ban Troy or Tengu doesn't ban Troy and that gets through? Then we could get into a wild, absolutely wild game where one player gets locked in or somebody has a like a bbs maybe, maybe you know maybe not a bbs but like an eight racks opener and it's just right from the get-go a tough situation yeah i mean we'll see uh, what the map is gonna be of course best giving his winner interview probably shouting out uh you know his fellow university teammates and other streamers um as you do and uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we're going to go into a break soon, right? Yep, this time around we're not getting baited into a, an ad. This will be a break, but we'll be back in just a couple moments.
Alrighty, we're back and we're about to get into our losers match. And we do have Troy banned by Tengu. I don't think we were any anybody surprised by that. We had a Citadel ban by Sock, and that leaves us with Blitz. Wow, yeah, Blitz, two player map, TVT. Uh, I don't know. What do you expect from this game, man? I always find I actually find TVT to be harder on two player maps than even TVP because at least in TVP, like I can wall, right? Or I, I know if Zealot pressure is coming, I can set up my Sim City in a way to defend Zealots. But TVT, a lot of times you don't scout for a long time. But on two player maps, you get hit with eight racks, you get hit with BBS. If you go for a fast scout and they do like a 14 CC, what do you do, right? So I actually think this is a really hard map to play TVT. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see what both players choose to do here. And uh, the game is ready. They are inside the lobby, guys. Uh, both players fighting for their tournament life here. So let's get into it. All right, in the top right, our red Terran, it's Tengu. And in the bottom right, the blue Terran, it is Sock. And honestly, man, Sock was spamming go, go, go. He's ready. Yeah. I always imagine, like, you know why I think the players always spam the chat when they're about to start? It's because I imagine they were talking smack to each other before... Uh, Production uh, ch changes the screen there. I mean, maybe they were, but what what would he what would he be saying? What would be the smack talk? What, what do you mean? Saying? Well, socks like I'm gonna seven rex and you're not. You better check it. Yeah, you better check it. I mean, yeah. I yeah. was actually hoping that we did get to see an eight rex or something, um, but it's not gonna happen this time around. I wonder if anybody will be really greedy in fourteen cc. There's the depot, as expected, and looks like this is socks fan club he's back man look at that sign yeah well we'll see if he's back <laughs> he's got a nice uh, tough challenge against uh, tengu here and uh, tengu he's a monster tvt i mean tengu is just really good so uh, hopefully over the years he will kind of show his skill and not give up but uh yeah again sock tvt master um two player map they will get to scout each other early they do have the options of playing tricky like you were mentioning but neither of them going for that neither of them going for a ford racks um and uh, both players kind of just opening very standard 12 gas i do want to point out that nobody scouted their natural at all i played a couple times on blitz where people have put their barracks or gateway like directly yeah. on the command center at the nat and if you're not paying attention you actually can miss it <laughs> So yeah. it, it, you got to be careful on this map because they could be proxied and they could be proxied real, real close to your base. We have a similar scout timing. It's like a 13 scout from both sides. We have mirrored builds. It looks like it was bulk gas from both sides. Yeah, and I, I haven't seen any games, any TVT games. I haven't played any TVT on Blitz. Uh, a lot of the Terrans on ladder, they just uh, veto two player maps because they don't want to deal with the uh, Protosses on there. Um, so it's rare to get TVTs on this map, I find. And I think it can create for interesting dynamics because the center three bases, which also have two gas total, uh, that you see in the mid right there at the three o'clock, th that's not siegeable by the high ground. Uh, none of the mining is. Maybe the left side of it by this uh, bridge over here is. Yeah, that that is definitely siegeable. But uh it, it just means that if either player gets air control or drop control or whatever drops there first uh, they can get a nice advantage and that's kind of the x factor in a split map here because whoever controls that gets a, a ridiculous amount of resources look at that body blocking sock did a good job to prevent it but tengu an even better job to actually get in and confirm what's going on because both players really didn't have great scouting beforehand Easily somebody could have put SCVs back onto gas and go for a one base, but 
Tengu confirms that that's not the case. Meanwhile, both players ended up going into fast command center as expected. Now this is where we start getting into varied, varied openers. How yeah. many vultures is it going to be? Are we going to well, have an additional factory? Also, they both went for just one marine, which opens up that wraith play quite a bit. Uh, but it looks like both players going for the third depot. Generally, the starboard does go down on two depot if you want to have a nice time for your wraith. Uh, Sock, po like, at this point, Sock just poking to see if his opponent also made a vulture. You know, in the early game, it's all about does your opponent make a vulture? Did, did they make an early machine shop to maybe get a tank going early? So you do want to poke and get that information. Looks like Tengu is the one playing a bit more defensively there in terms of just keeping his vultures on his side of the map. But I think both players kind of realize that each of each other is going for this three-fact vulture opening. Three-fact for Sock. It is actually two-fact two fact for Tengu, yeah. for Tengu. And that was not the trade that you want. Yeah, Tengu is going oh. to be super aggressive, looks like. One for one, two for two, and Sok will get the advantage on this last Vulture, but actually didn't miss there. No, 30 HP, and Sok, man, he's going to feel confident after that one. Uh, Tengu, with a two-fact Goliath, actually wants to put on a lot of pressure because he's he does not need to get a Machine Shop, whereas the three-fact player at some point does put a Machine Shop down, but because Sok had the good trades there, he will free up some of that space for himself, but then loses that Vulture, so... Yeah, I mean, pretty standard here. I think Sock has a bit of an edge because the two-facting player with the Armory usually puts on more pressure. Oh, four-fact. Well, cancelled. I guess he saw that it's only two-fact, so he knows that yeah. it's going to be Tank Goliath. And he doesn't want to be running Mass Vulture into Tank Goliath, so smart cancel right there. Yeah, and this opening from Tengu, he is getting a machine shop early. He recognizes that he can't basically pressure with the Goliath. Often the two-facting player in this situation will go for a starport um, because the three-facting player kind of has a late armory, has late academy. Uh, the drop can combo very well with the four Goliaths. And it also dissuades the three-facting player from you know, poking up with the tank too early. So that's also why Sock didn't go for that fourth factory. If he went for the four factories, then the starport, you know, his army would be that much later. The starport from Tengu would be really strong. But Tengu, instead of getting the starport, he's actually going to start double tank production from the machine shops. One thing that I am noticing now is Tengu, who did have his vultures on high ground, you know, trying to bring pressure to Sock, all of a sudden has relinquished that pressure. And now we're getting mine set up on Tengu's side of the map. There was a tank being rallied, but I guess it's going to back off for now because there's only just one. And instead, Sok is going to take a third command center off this. Yeah, super standard here. Again, Sok is respecting the possibility of Starport, meaning that he doesn't want to play overly offensive with how he positions his tanks. And this is the highest kind of EV plays, or, or just the, the most solid plays to just sit back, get your third command center. Because you have three fact production and your opponent started with two factories, it's unlikely that they can overwhelm you. So strategically, this makes a lot of sense from Sock. Tengu is gonna go for four factories. He's gonna play super standard, um, does clear these mines out, probably will take his command center shortly thereafter. We see supplies are pretty much dead even. So no real discrepancy there, but third commands are considerably farther along. It is actually a four-fact follow-up for Tengu, but in TVT, you know, it's hard to make timings work. So I'm not sure what the intention with this is. So there's still no command center put down for him. That's I actually thought it was gonna be a starport, but that's the barracks for Sock because it got taken down. Yeah, well, Tengu is getting the four factories because he wants to match Vulture production. That's the strength of three-fact Vulture openings. You get so many Vultures out, it's so efficient uh, that a player that goes two factories, they just need those extra two factories so that they can get Vultures of their own and get some map control and get some mines out there. So I don't think Tengu wants to attack. He's just kind of forced into this because of his opening. And you can see that now he's going to take that third base and 
basically sock just had a slightly better opening than than tangu did three that's why three factories are really strong and kind of the go-to build here they do pretty well in almost all situations um, but it, it's 100 percent playable from both sides i don't think anyone has a, an edge here it looks like already sock is attempting to split the map and this is a two-player map and if yeah. he can get mid left or if either player can get mid left they're gonna have a base advantage which will be huge starport is done for sock now you can see in some games race switches being a thing and it looks like that's actually going to be an add-on onto the starport and an additional starport so we may actually have that race switch yeah the thing about two player maps generally in tvt and historically is that they're very splittable um and I think there's no exception here with Blitz. Ooh. Blitz especially, it's kind of a narrow map. It, it's easy to build a lot of turrets and kind of limit air movement as well. But the X Factor is these two middle bases. And the right side has more resources than the left side. Yeah. And actually, that was not an additional starport. That's a science facility. So we're going to be rushing into plus two. He's got a couple more factories coming down, putting him at six. Meanwhile, Tengu's finally gotten his third base up and running but sock is taking his fourth base now that base not as key as the third one because it only has minerals but sock so far slightly in the lead in terms of eco but supplies say that tengu's up right now i don't know now i mean this map's pretty much split like tengu uh, has a better uh, position yeah. too it looks like because of how the architecture of this map plays out there's actually only two lanes and the middle right lane like the small bridge there on, next to the three o'clock that's not really a lane you, you can never attack through that so controlling the side this left side where tengu is um in the middle that's the most important part on this map and tengu just has it and i mean it, it doesn't matter you know sock has six factories but what's he gonna do just attack into tanks like I don't know, th this map, it seems like you really have to prioritize getting Ooh. into starports early. So Sock gave up the left side and instead is going to take the mid-right island, is what it seems like. I think he's already unloaded an SCV there. Now, if he can somehow secure the middle, and if he can secure the middle, that'll allow him to get all of mid-right, which obviously has more resources than mid-left. But that's going to be a hard thing to do. We do have an unsiege. Okay, so he oh. is going to actually... Big timing bust. here! It's all about, can Sock take this position? If he can, it'll be huge. Uh, Tengu's not in time to defend. Look, his army is kind of just chilling. He had priority in terms of being there with four tanks, but he gave that up so easily. And now Sock suddenly has, well, at least no one controls this, this mid base, but Tengu, honestly, he's gonna be kicking himself for that because he could have just, if those units were there from the get-go, he would have stopped that attack. Yeah, and Sock just expanding like a madman fifth base going down for him. I guess Tengu also has his fourth base. He's at he's already gotten the corner base. Just needs to transfer some SCVs there. We've got what is that? Eight, nine factories for Sock? Yeah. And uh I mean it's interesting because I really think this map will get Ooh. locked down very quickly. And I, I don't really see why the ground army is so important. Um, because you know, once plus two kicks in, your supply lead doesn't really matter too much in terms of busting positions. If there's enough tanks there, there's no way you can get through there. Um, so we'll have to see, but Sock, he's just pushing this pre plus two timing super oppressive and Sock's macro is just insane, but also his units are just where they have to be, whereas Tengu's units are kind of lagging behind and a lot of supplies caught up in the, the dropships he's building. Yeah, and a lot of the tanks were on the low ground. So they didn't get off the shots that they needed and now not only does he bust mid left he now has, secu uh, he has secured mid left so he can start thinking about building a command center there he still has high ground advantage so he's going to take down basically two tanks for one yeah i mean tengu i think he's just not focusing on the important part of this map i, I don't know what his units are doing they're basically afk but not where they should be and sock is constantly coming i mean he understands this is the most important part of the map and he's constantly pushing not wasting any time and the thing is he this these trades are all so good for sock that he's also just snowballing the supply 
Yeah, this is just clinical. <laughs> Move in with vultures, kill tanks, and he's getting a huge, huge tank trades in his favor. Now, Tengu does have something like five dropships, but we haven't seen any usage of the dropships. Look at these, look at these SCVs just repairing the tanks also. Yeah, Tengu, man, he's kind of losing uh, ground rapidly. I think the game's already spiraled out of control. Uh, Tengu's top left is now compromised. He has nothing kind of shoring up that position there. And Sock, he's just with that insane macro. Because he started snowballing here, he's just going to keep going. He's just going to keep rallying all his units. And I just don't it's think over. Tengu can stop it. Yeah, it's, it's over. It, it's too awkward now because Tengu needs to defend the top left side. But that means he's got to give up his right side. And now this third base is brief. It's high ground. Sock like hasn't lost the tank either. I, I think his plus two power spike should be done. We just saw Tengu's at only just plus one weapon. So this just spiraled completely out of control. And this is what I was talking about, why Sock is just an expert in TBT. Like there was no point in this game except for maybe when Tengu got mid-left initially, that Sock was out of control. Yeah, I mean, Sok uh, just kind of took the driver's seat and kept going. One big point here, I think, is that Tengu started building his dropships very early on. Meanwhile, Sok just focused on his ground production and, you know, you were mentioning, he went up to that nine, like eight, nine factory count very early and you can see he actually doesn't have that many drops. He has maybe one, two, whereas Tengu has like six. So that's a lot of supply to be and resources to be caught up in basically a unit that does nothing. I think it would have worked out because I really think the only point of contention on this map is that high ground in the, you know, in the middle left part of the map that Tengu already had, but he just never reinforced it on time. Yeah, now we're going to see Tengu drop, but even though it gets unloaded, it's not on really anything key. Yes, it'll deny the third gas, but speaking of denying gases and bases, I mean, Sox denied the third base. He's about to kill the top left base. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, that counter drop was uh, Tengu's only hope, but it's doing damage. Unfortunately, he's losing three bases at the same time, and... That's gonna be it. I mean, Sox up 60 supply in this matchup, and uh, tanks everywhere for Sock. Even the command center doesn't get lifted, and that's it, man. That's all it takes. Sock is so fast with it, also. Like, he kills top left, he killed the tanks outside the nap, and he just instantly sieges it while also defending his main, while also reinforcing other positions. And you gotta also consider he's already taken five bases. It is absurd how good this guy at this matchup. This is gonna be the last Hail Mary from Tengu here, unload, but the reinforcing tanks are already here. He basically doesn't kill any of them. Yeah, GG, it's called Sock, an absolute monster in TVT, and we've seen him gatekeep amateur Terrans time and again. And I recall even when Scan had that nice, uh, that nice run and he was doing really well in his group, but then he also had to play Sock and Sock, man, he's just clinical in this matchup. Yeah, he is definitely the gatekeeper of TBT. If you can take down Sock, you can pretty much take down anyone in that matchup. And it's not like I think Tengu even played poorly. I think if he somehow could have gotten a drop off, like he, he had four or five drops, right? If he was able to do a drop while Sock was initially pushing mid left. You know, maybe the game could have gotten interesting because we would have had Sock's entire army out of position, drop in the main. It could have gotten weird, but he didn't have any counter pressure at all. It all came down to that nine o'clock high ground yeah. that Tengu took early and he just never reinforced. And honestly, again, I'm looking back at this game. I'm still a bit shocked as to why Sock played the way that he did. I think most players would just be content with uh, doing exactly what Tengu did meaning getting into drops early and just splitting the map. But Sock doubled down on the ground production and just steamrolled through him. I think maybe Tengu wasn't expecting that. I think Tengu maybe uh, gave too much respect or, you know, kind of just assumed both players would, you know, when you play at this level, you kind of just think, well, the other player is not going to go for this kind of move because it's not very good on this map. Like, again, it's all about that split map. It's all about teching the starport as early as possible. And Sock was just like, no, I'm going to check you regardless. I'm going to flood 
ground units. And if you can't hold, that's your problem, bud. And that's exactly what happened. Well, we got to look at that mid left uh, moment that you're talking about. Just something I noticed as units were reinforcing was Tengu had like 10 Goliaths and there were no Goliaths for Sock. So maybe there was yeah. lack of add ons for Tengu. Not exactly sure. But either way, Sock does eliminate Tengu. That's a little bit unfortunate for him. But we do set up for Action versus Sock rematch. We're going into a break and then we'll be back.
in the final game of the day is upon us. We have a Dark Origin ban by Sock, Apocalypse ban by Action, and for the third day in a row, that gives us Retro as the final map. Yeah, Retro is an awesome, super standard map. A rematch of the first game that Action played, you know, the second game of today, the first game that these two have played in which action kind of dominated sock really i think sock was a bit sloppy with the execution of his build though the the build order itself i think was okay uh strategically but um we'll see man we'll see what sock chooses to go for here he is probably gonna feel a bit under pressure you know during the break i was trying to think back to all the games that i've seen of sock play tvz i think both him and mong in the most recent games that i saw they always tried to do a mech switch and we just saw that in the first game so maybe it's just a thing with them and maybe sock should consider just trying to play sk terran but it's it's action man he's so good versus sk terran we'll see though our players are ready so let's get into our final game And in the bottom right, we do have our Zerg. It's action. And in the top right, the blue Terran at his sock. But you know what? I was watching Royal Play vs. Jadon yesterday. And oh, yeah. He uh, enlightened me about a wall. You can actually completely wall top left on Retro and have Marines pop out on the correct side. I thought Retro. Top left? Was... Yeah, top left. I'll send you the screenshot. I actually thought the only good walling positions were top right, which Sock ended up getting, and bottom left, but not the case, man. Yeah, well, I'm... I, <laughs> you've piqued my interest. I'd love to see <laughs> that. Nayo can send it to me, uh, you know, after this, maybe. Uh, but I will be grinding last Epoch, uh, I think. <laughs> I do <keep laughs> saying that, man. Eventually, I might give in, but not you, yet. You can play a Hammered in the last Epoch, bro. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you is like, you keep talking about it, but what builds are there? Like, can I play Hammered in your talk? I'm... Anything, man. Anything you can imagine, it's there. It's in Last Epoch. Okay, well, we'll I guess I'll... Eight racks. Yeah, eight racks with a wall. The SC... the second SCV coming down, you know, I had hoped that maybe this is BBS, but this is this is not Artosa trying to BBS action. It is Sock just playing a normal eight racks with the wall to float it back into position and action has the perfect counter because this is an overpool. Oh my god, action, he's sick. Sick to go for this, sick read. Again, this is one part of this matchup that's so difficult for Zerg. Terran can always open for a 50-50 game in terms of if they just go Rax expand, it's good against everything. They're not behind against anything. Zerg, however, has the gamble. If they open 12 hatch, well, it's slightly behind against 8 racks. If they open overpool, well, it's slightly behind, uh, you know, racks expand. So in this case, Zerg opted for this overpool opening and it's going to pay off. And overpool is really good against 8 racks. It basically completely shuts this build down. He can get a very quick lair follow up as well. So Zerg's going to be fi feeling super fine about this. That first Marine is moving out, though. This is a bit risky. <laughs> There's no way he built a bunker, right? Like, that's... Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, he has to lift this Rax. This Marine is dead. Like, uh, this was a bit troll, I think. Uh, because he, he can't actually run it back because the Rax has to be landed. But uh, this is a good move from Sock. Brings the second Marine with the SCV. It will be enough to fight against two Lings. But actually, Action has made a couple more Lings here. Six Lings total. Yep, I'm not sure what this was intended to do, I guess, to make sure that he doesn't get hit by, like, a four Marine SCV timing. Yeah. But it does force the Marines back into position, and like you are saying, the lair is way far ahead in terms of uh, momentum for this game. Like, the command center just coming down, there's no gas for Sock at all. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Nyokin, because uh, basically Terran has the option of delaying their natural to go for some kind of gimmick like 3-4 marine timing in which you kind of late bunker the nat against overpool. 
And if Zerg only has four lings, they're susceptible to that. So from Action's point of view, I think he's just playing as safe as he possibly can. And I think that just shows how confident he is against Sock. Yep, and we are approaching the point in the game where if there was going to be a Lurker buff, Hydrogen needed to be put down at this point. But no Hydrogen, so this should just be normal fire. We do have two racks opener again from Sock, so it's going to be Fast Academy. There it is. Yeah, and uh, so far, kind of standard uh, follow-ups here from both players. Sock could have also uh, went into eBay from this opening, but given the fact that Action opened Overpool and then went straight into Gas, nothing like a 3-hatch or something or a 2.5-hatch build, um, I think this is the correct call because then if he opened eBay, his upgrades would be kind of slow uh, and the Mutalisks would have a lot of time to put on pressure. So. I like this, but it will be very hard for him to actually push out. Most likely, Action will have speed by the time the two racks attack comes, and he'll be able to react. So we'll see if Sock actually goes for a push. And the thing is, Sock is completely blind here. He needs to get the comm stats first. He needs to see what the drone count is for Zerg. I imagine this build order is basically going to be identical to what we saw on Radeon, because like you're saying, it's going to be hard to push. Like, we our academy is later. We didn't get anything with our eight racks. So what can you do to really catch up? Well, the only thing I think you can do is yeah. go fast factory, but I think that's third in racks. fact a third rack. So he's gonna try and make something happen with this character. Yeah. Sock scans the gnat. He sees the drone count, knows it's safe to go out and has the full wall behind it. So this is actually a really, really good spot for Terran to be in. It's gonna force double sunk here. The first creep colony is already morphing. Muta's on the way. But uh, this this move out has done its job. Hopefully Sock doesn't commit here. And what Sock can do now is just keep these units out on the map. Behind that, he is going to have four racks. But instead, he is going to pull back and be conservative. If he joins these units that he has, the, the Medic plus the two Marines, those could bust two sunks. But I think Action is actually really set up here to force the Terran back into his main. Yeah, this did a lot of damage you know i was expecting to see like a macro hatch in action base by now there's no macro hatch there's no third hatch at any of the other bases so being forced to build two sunken plus not having any macro hatches is a really good move oh look at that turret timing absolutely perfect yeah four racks is uh super committed though um and actually usually means that the terran doesn't have as many turrets and action went for a very aggressive line in terms of just making mutas. He's already up at eight. He's gonna snipe this turret, and now this is gonna create a lot of problems for Terran. He has to keep the Marines here until the other turret gets built. But actually, the other turret will get built. And Sock's playing really well. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, but are you getting worried that there's no macro hatch or third hatch from action? I feel like, yes, he's doing damage with the mutas, but. What is our mid-game plan? Are we just full-on Muta Man and praying that that wins the game? Yeah, it's very strange because he actually has a very high drone count that he's prioritizing these Mutas, but I think it's okay because this is 4 racks, so there's no factory yet, 7 minutes in. Um, Terran's not teching, so I think Action's just respecting the potential move out here from Terran, but I, I do agree with you, Nyokin. He needs a third hatch at some point here. Well, he finds that turret at the top, but that was a clutch repair. It bought so much time. The Marines racked up a lot of damage, but in the end, there's still so many Mutalisk here. But the Mutalisk ball did get softened up a little bit, not enough to dissuade Action from coming in again. And now he's getting into the sweet spot. Nope, he's going to back off. Yeah, Action doing so much damage here. And again, the problem for Terran is he has no factory. So actually, it turns out uh, this is why. He actually went for four sunks. Um, and Action's playing this counter-attack game with the Mutalisks, but that does mean he is pretty much, well, in a sense, he's all in. And now, off of two hatcheries, he's going Queen's Nest Hydra then. Yeah, I think Sock actually built his factory at his natural, if, if I'm guessing correctly. I'm assuming that big building has to be the factory. We do have a jump on the turrets at the natural, plus one weapon on the Mutas. He's going to make these turrets pretty much melt, but... The Marines get in position and do quite a bit of damage, but all the turrets are gone. Yeah, I mean, Action, for some reason, just transitioned into the super all-in style. 
Uh, maybe he... Uh, I'm not quite sure if he misread what was happening in this game and pre-built those sunks a bit too early. Uh, it is strange that given the fact that he made so many drones early on, he didn't get a third hatchery at all, even in his main, and now he's just teching the hive uh, for what can only possibly be a two-base defiler lurker follow-up. But look at this, man. This is the weakness of Forax and not getting a factory. Like, you really need Starport to eventually stop these Munas. Because at this level, once the mutas have plus one, once they have a bunch, you know, they have 11 mutas, they chew through marine turret. Yeah, and he's now gone through all the turrets at the natural, and he caught through the turret in the main. He just runs by those marines. Somehow, none of the mutas die. We're back into the natural, racking up even more kills. Yeah, I mean, honestly, action's playing sick here. I, I think the confidence to play with just two hatcheries here and keep making mutas um it, it's it's fine it's good again like just this is the weakness of going for racks like whenever you delay your factory as Terran, you allow zerg the timing window in which mutas are effective gets greatly increased and actually having more marine medic doesn't really counter mutalists unless you're fighting them in the middle of the map like unless you're fighting against mutaling but this kind of style where Zerg sits behind Sunks at his gnat and just harasses your gnat and then your main with Mutalisks, your barracks count is irrelevant. Yeah, well, we haven't gotten to see what Action's tech choice is, but I actually do hope it's Guardians. Okay, it's going to be Defiler, so he's going to go for a Lurker push. The reason I was saying I hope it's Guardians is because there's no gnat gas for, for Sop. Like, he can't build any of the key tech units, but... We are going to go into double starport science facility. He is trying to find another opening at the top side. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it, it's very rare to see Zerg play like this, and I think actually this is kind of Action's trademark. I don't think you'll ever see Sulky or Soma or Queen play like this, uh, but I think this game is gonna it, it's gonna work. There's no tanks to stop these lurkers. He doesn't even need the filers. He could just walk these five lurkers up to the gnat. What is Terran going to do about it? Well, I can tell you this. It all comes down to this army right outside of Sock's base right now. If he sends this army back into his main, he's dead. Because he's never getting out of campaign. Ever. Oh! Lurker's no, burrow! that's it. This game's yep. over. Yep, there's no count. He can't get out anymore. He's locked in. He yeah. has no tank, like he said. He's not mining his nat gas. So the most uh, vessels he can build is like one or two. Oh, massive. Dude, act Action is absolutely sick. I don't know what kind of Zerg player plays like this, but it was amazing. GG gets called, Sock gets blasted, and Action, my god, man, I... <laughs> Let me tell you, man, that that's just a totally different take on Zerg in, in the ZVT matchup than most Zergs have. Yeah, and he played it to perfection, and we were coming into the day saying that these Terran players need to be worried because you've got killers on the e other end of the matchup, and you're seeing it right there. Like, Sock was technically on the map a couple times, but was he really? Not really. Like, the mutas were just blasting everything, yeah. and then once the contain set up, and this guy doesn't have his gnat really running, you're just dead. Yeah, I, I just can't stress it enough conceptually how, how strange, but also how awesome it is how action played. 99% of Zergs there don't feel comfortable playing without a third hatch, without eventually a fourth hatch, especially given how many drones Action made early on. Of course, now he's down to 19 because um, he made a bunch of sunks. But remember, Sock, when he scanned the gnat, he had full drone saturation. So Action at some point just made this call where he's like, no, you know what? You're delaying your factory. I'm just going to make mutalisks. And... Uh, just off of two hatcheries doing this is super impressive. It's very high level because you can't contest the Terran's production in the middle of the map. But when you have enough sunks to defend against whatever amount of Marines could be counterattacking you, you can play like this. You can do exactly what Action is doing here, sitting at the natural, just harassing. Plus one makes short work of turrets and... And then just to follow up with uh, with Lurker Defiler push is so out of the box, but just makes so much sense. And you see how it won on the spot, basically. Yeah, and those highlights that we saw of action just crushing through the natural is 
one of the main reasons why I just always play Valkyries. It's just like yeah. he lost one Muta and killed a million Marines and medics and SVs. Once it's I mean, that, call, that's, that's the it. reason the factory timing yeah. is six thirty, man. Yeah, you just can't do anything. It's like, oh, Terrace are gone. Well, what do I do now? Yeah, you desperately need a starport in this matchup at this level. Like the Mutas are just so oppressive, and uh, you know the four. That's why four racks you don't really see it anymore. Uh, there's so many things that are going into this. It cuts into your economy, so even getting tanks is very hard, which is why making the lurkers made a lot of sense. Like Terran's not going to be able to afford taking the starport and getting tanks at the same time. Just conceptually. Spot on from action, honestly. I, I'm i at a loss for words. It was really good how he uh, countered that. You can see he's feeling himself. He's he's excited about that win. And he looks as strong as he's looked in previous seasons, just like Best is looking really strong here. So I'm happy that action makes it through. We That does confirm us. We've got two Protoss, two Zergs, two Terrans now into the round of 16. Yeah, and uh, not surprising, again, Action and Best are monsters versus Terran, and that's uh, what I was saying, uh, you know, I think that's what we were talking about leading up to this group, is are they going to really lose to Terran? No, I don't think so, man. Yeah, it's just not going to be the case. Uh, unless that Terran is uh, uh, Light, Rush, or Royal, or JYJ, or I, I guess there's yeah, a lot the really list good going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, but even then, they'd have a hard time, man. Yeah, for sure. Like every time I watch these games of Pro League, like Light versus Jadong, or Light versus Sulky, or Royal versus Jadong, which I just watched yesterday, the games are always really close, really crazy. In fact, um, for those of you out there, you can find the VOD of Light versus Jadong from like a week ago on Retro absolutely nuts multitask from both sides light was super dead and then he just attacks like five areas at the same time yeah oh man just uh impressive impressive play here from action today against uh sock particularly even against best that game was was kind of insane it, it abruptly ended but action the way he got back into the game from not the best opening uh was really impressive and Honestly, I would have loved to see a best of three from that series, best versus action, because I think that game was probably the closest game we've had in ASL so far. I agree with that, and if these players get drafted together into the same group, we could actually see a best of three. If I was best, because of my high win rate versus action in particular, and also my wins coming in ASL versus him, I feel like... I would probably draft action just because I think at the beginning of today's day, it said best is like seven and three overall versus action in ASL. That's a high win rate. Yeah. Well, action is a god. He is going to make it to the round of 16. He constantly, you know, performs really well in, in ASL. Action, probably the most underrated player, um, considering his skill level, actually, if I think about it. Yeah, Action is one of those sleeper picks that you put on your fantasy draft team because he's got the potential, not necessarily the potential, the, the skills to go really far. I think he's made it round of eight, round of four a couple of times. I think he made round of eight last season. I would have to double check, but definitely a really good player. As someone mentioned in the Team Liquid thread, there's a reason KT recruited him and, you know, Flash recommended him. It's because of how good he is just straight up in macro games like what you just saw. Well, yeah. I guess that wasn't technically a macro game, it was well, a micro game, but it turned in. He's just good, man. He's like, a, he's a pretty complete player. Like, he plays an insane macro game. He can play aggressively, and that's what you look for in, in Zerg players, honestly. Yeah, at the highest levels, you can't just play macro all the time. You can't just do cheese all the time. you got to be the full package. We've got a rundown of how today went. Best took down Tengu. Action taking down Sock, Best taking down Action in a close game, Sock eliminating Tengu, and then the rematch of Action versus Sock again goes Action's way. Yeah, Best played really well today uh, in, in both of his games, just super solid and never missed a beat. He's looking really strong this season. 
Yeah, and that's the end of the groups this week. We've gone through all three of them. We'll be back next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at the same time. And those three remaining groups still have amazing players in them. I'm sure they're going to show the remaining group. Uh, yeah, surely. I mean, uh, next week, uh, the first day is going to be Group D, uh, which is going to be JYJ, TY, aka Baby, Shuttle, and Jadong. So that's going to be sick. Group E is going to be Snow Speed, Mong, Shine. Also an awesome group. I'm looking forward to watch the Terrans in that group as well. And Shine, I love Shine and I love Snow. So Group E, I'm super looking forward to. Group F, Royal, Beast, Rain, Barracks. That's going to be the last group. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, still so much. This is just the first week of ASL, man. And you know ASL, it it, it goes on for a while. It does go on. I think it's ending in April, if I remember correctly. But yeah, these groups coming up, they've got a lot of interesting uh, aspects. Everybody wants to know what's TY's state. Like, how, how good is he actually right now? The fact that he even qualifies... ASL kind of shows you how good he is because he's got a tough group. He's got JYJ, ASL champion. We've got legendary player Jadong waiting for him. And we've got Shuttle, who I think people underrate Shuttle, especially in PvP. This guy yeah. is nuts. Like I've seen games of him where he has 30 gates, three quarters of the map on Polypoid, and it's just an endless amount of units. And then, of course, Group E, again, these Terran players, they're in for a nightmare. Snow, he's, I think, got easily the best PVT. And then you've got Shine, who's willing to do anything and throw it at you. Yeah, Shine, honestly, <laughs> I feel like half the time I'm always talking about, oh, this player's underrated, that player's underrated. <laughs> Shine's insanely good. And not only is he good in, in just being this kind of tricky, like, big brain. 10,000 IQ Zerg, but actually uh, his his macro game is really strong. He's just a really solid fundamental player. And I think it's because he understands the game so well that he can also be extremely tricky. So uh, it's going to be hard for both Speed and Mong in that group. And uh, yeah, I mean, still just so much StarCraft ahead of us. Uh, so many good games. I'm sure this season, the map pool is good. The player pool is good. And, uh, yeah, man, I mean, we're just getting started. And I bet you Shine's not vetoing Troy. I have a feeling that's not going <laughs> to go from him. I think he's going to make sure. He's mass gaming on Troy, man. If he could, he could. He would probably veto every single map uh, in the ladder other than Troy. Well, the thing is, is I think probably the Terran players will also think like, oh, I got to be worried about Troy versus Shine. And they may end up just outright vetoing it. and then you know, actually shines focusing on like a sniper build on Citadel or something, for example. Yeah, shines just uh, insane at a best of one, man. Uh, remember that ma that season where he obliterated Royal with his uh, Lurker drop or whatever? That yeah. was sick. That was such a sick build. There's that other season where he had a really tricky like Guardian kind of build on uh, Odyssey against Light. That was actually best of three, and he almost won in that best of three against Light. He was absolutely insane. So Shine, just really excited to watch him play this season. I think he has a good group to do well in, and I think he can definitely make the round of 16. Um, who else? I mean, who else are we excited about? Baby, a.k.a. T.Y. Uh, Jadong ha has been in absolutely great form recently. So if there's ever a, an ASL that he will do well in, it's definitely this one. And I think he's poised to get out of his group as well. And there's also Rain. The return of Rain. Everybody wants to know what his level of play is. Every time he comes back, he's always looking really strong despite being on a long-term break. Actually, in Group F, the player I'm looking most forward to is Beast because in the StarCast TV Star League, he actually went really far. And he did have a lot of cheeses. But he did play a lot of macro games, too. So I'm wondering how far he can actually go. Yeah, Beast, uh, like Killer, you know, these Zerg players that uh, are under the radar. I mean, it seems like I'm describing a lot of Zerg player, uh, people as under the radar. But yeah, yeah looking forward to that one. But that's going to be it for today, guys. And uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, 
much love from us to you. And yeah, uh, Nayokin, how about... Yeah. Especially that guy holding the sign, man. Because... Yeah, absolutely. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, make sure to reach out to us uh, and uh, or uh, type in the comments and the YouTube comments, whatever. Uh, but yeah, man, I don't know. I was uh, happy that you've had me so far, Nayokin. It's been a lot of fun and waking up is uh, really fun. And this whole thing has been really amazing. And it's, we're just getting started. Indeed, we are. Games have been great, too. So again, guys, thank you so much for watching. I've also been enjoying casting with Jip, and I know you guys have been leaving good feedback on the YouTube channel. Uh, so keep doing that. And Look at that guy. Legend. You are a legend indeed. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll be back next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday.